So this morning, I'm giving a message called Giving from a Whole Heart, and uh, this comes from Matthew chapter 10, verses 1 through 13 is where we're going to start all of this. Uh, giving from a whole heart. Jesus called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. Philip and Bartholomew. Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus. Simon the Zealot and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Do not get any gold or silver or copper to take with you in your belts. No bag for the journey or extra shirt or sandals or a staff, for the worker is worth his keep. Whatever the town or village you enter, search there for some worthy person and stay at their house until you leave. As you enter the home, give it your greeting. If the home is deserving, let your peace rest on it. If not, let your peace return to you. So let's we'll start out with a very simple concept here, which is no one can give something that they don't have. So James 1.17 says, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. You can't give love if you don't have love. You find it hard to give mercy if you have not experienced it. You can't give money to someone in need if your bank account's at zero. You can't give forgiveness if you don't have forgiveness in your own heart. You can't give a drink of water from an empty glass. And it's really just a very simple thing. You can't give what you don't have. You can't even give a cold away if you don't have a cold. So we must first receive the good news of salvation before we can pass that along to others. Romans 10, 13 through 15 says, Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one who they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? How can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. So as believers, we're called to give away many things. We're called to give the love that God has given us to others. John 13, 34 and 35, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Jesus says plainly, as I have loved you. Him loving us comes first. We're called to give comfort to one another from the comfort that we receive from God. 2 Corinthians 1, 3-4 Praise be to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. We're called to give our finances to further God's kingdom in this world. Malachi 3.10 says, Bring the full tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord of hosts. See if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing without measure. Now, a lot of people, um, churches in general, a lot of people say that they just don't have the money to tithe. The truth is, is that we have the money. It does exist, but we're unwilling to do it God's way for his purposes. We can't give what we don't have true, but if we have money for anything else in life, we do have money to tithe. 
But why do I say this? It's because God says, if you will bring your full tithe into the storehouse to further his work, he will in turn bless you beyond measure or without measure. I think I've shared this before. It's like when um, I was pastor over the church over in Walton. So when, so when I started there, I actually took the job with a zero salary, which was fun. So I started there doing that. That's faith right there, right? You, gotta, you take that job for zero salary. They did give me a house, which was, which was great. So I started there. Well, in the beginning, I am not kidding when I say that there was resistance to even lighting the candles for service because they would burn down. And they didn't see, like, they burned down. They have to buy more candles. So the attitude towards finances, it was, there was a lot of fear. There was a lot of, you know, like resistance towards, you know, just how, how, they, how they looked at finances. So do you know that I would just promote to the congregation every week, I would just say, if you give to further the kingdom of God the way that he wants you to give, you will be blessed beyond measure. And that's what the scripture says. When I finished my time there, the congregation was giving two times what was required of the budget. And they were sharing stories like, I have more money now with the 90% than I ever did with 100%. They were sharing awesome things that had happened, like, like I shared the story of the lady who someone showed up to her house and here's the keys to a practically brand new car. There you go, thank you. When your car was falling apart and it wasn't working anymore and you didn't know what you are going to do, God works. When we do things God's way, he goes to work. So it's really up to us to decide if we want to be blessed without measure or not. Uh, this is the first note that I have here in your sermon notes. God provides what he teaches you to give. Believers already possess the resources. The question is, do we trust God to do things his way? So apart from just money or finances, would you agree that God knows more than we do? <laughs> would you agree that God works in ways that we don't understand? <laughs> and would you say that God is unlimited? Yeah, he's not limited by anything. So. so all of these examples are just to say that God requires a lot of us. However, he says a few things about this. This is Luke 12, 48. From everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who's been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. Jesus said it's more blessed to give than to receive. And freely you have received, freely give. We must receive from Jesus first. Then we can give. So when Jesus said this, he said, freely you have received. The receiving comes first, right? Where does the receiving come from? God, from James 1.17. Every good and perfect gift is from above. So when we, we must receive from Jesus first to be able to freely give to other people. And if you sense that you have very little left to give, this is not just, this could be money, this could be time, this could be compassion, this could be love, this could be forgiveness. If you sense that you have very little left to give, it's time to return to the well and for a deep drink of the living water. If we live and we function the way that God wants us to function, you will never run out of what you need to give. Because it doesn't come from you. So, and I'm not saying like, this is, this is by the way, this is not a financial sermon. <laughs> this is one, so the finances were just one. There was the comfort, there was the love, there was the forgiveness, there's all these things. So like, but if we're trying to give them out of what we think we have, we are going to run out very quickly. Okay, so Jesus said, freely you have received, freely give. If you receive from God first, if that's your priority, then you can freely give it all away because God just supplies. God is the provider, right? It is one of his names. He is a great provider. If you're giving out of your own resources, time, money, talents, forgiveness, mercy, love, helping, whatever it is, you will run out very quickly. And then you will be 
exhausted. You will exhaust that resource. But if you receive from God primarily, you will be able to give and give and give and give and give, and you'll not, you'll not be able to exhaust that resource because God is an infinite resource of everything that we need. So let's look at the context of Matthew chapter 10 here. Matthew 10 challenge us, uh, challenges us with sending the apostles and how this illustrates that whole, complete people, I'm calling them here Irene people because we've used that word a lot lately. Good word, though. Irene people, this Greek peace people, are used by God to do the miraculous and to bless others. Matthew 10 provides a blueprint for a Christian mission reflecting the challenges, the cost, and the commitment required, but also accompanying authority, divine enablement, and enablement and assurance of reward. The call to fearlessly proclaim the kingdom, even in the face of persecution, rings across the ages and reminds believers that ultimate allegiance belongs to God. Jesus calls his 12 disciples and gives them authority over unclean spirits and to heal diseases and sickness and identifies them each by name. Jesus sends the disciples out with specific instructions there to go to the lost sheep of Israel and to proclaim the kingdom of heaven, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, and cast out demons. They're to depend on the hospitality of worthy people in each town, and their peace will rest on receptive homes. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at this uh, passage in Matthew 10, but we're going to work backwards through it to get to the point that I'm making this morning. Whole people, complete people, Irene peace people, bless other people, and God uses these whole and complete restored people to do the mighty works that we see in Scripture. We're going to see it here. People who know Jesus, who have an encounter with him, are used by God to do miraculous things. God doesn't change, right? He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do you want to be a person who not only gets well or is made well or is made complete or is made whole yourself, but then in turn becomes the person who helps make other people become whole and complete and well? Do you want to be that person? Do you want to be a person who can bless other people? Do you want to be used by God for something wonderful to happen in the life of another person? There are keys in this passage that point us as to, to how that happens. Jesus sends out the disciples to proclaim the kingdom of God, raise the dead, drive out demons. So working backwards, we're going to start in 11 through 13, Matthew 10, 11 through 13. Whatever town or village you enter, search there for some worthy person, stay at the house until you leave. As you enter the home, give it your greeting. If the home is deserving, let your peace rest on it. If it is not, let your peace return to you. So the apostles were to go about doing the work of God, staying in whatever town or village they happened to be in, a worthy person's home. Verse 13 says, let your peace rest on the home if it's deserving. If not, let your peace return to you. So here again, and I hit on this a lot, but there's a reason for this. Here and again, we see the word Irene, and this word is so powerful. Irene peace, we have come to learn, is so much more than a feeling. In fact, it's not a feeling at all. It's the thing that produces that sense or feeling of peacefulness, it's the engine behind it. So what we know of Irene is that it is God's gift of wholeness. That's what it is. So if we look at verse 12 and 13 again, we get a very different take on let your peace rest on the home and how it affects the understanding of what's happening here. Verse 12 through 13, if we were to put in the uh, definition of God's gift of wholeness, for 12 through 13, it reads like this. As you enter the home, give it your greeting. If the home is deserving, let your gift of wholeness rest on it. If it is not, let your gift of wholeness return to you. So we're just taking the definition and we're plugging it in there. 
This relates back to the main point of today's message. How can you give something that you don't have? So right here, we just showed that the apostles are not to enter a home when they're out proclaiming the kingdom of God, healing the sick, raising the dead, casting out demons. They're not to enter a home and just to give it a peaceful feeling or for the people uh, providing a place to stay, but rather they are into a home and let God's gift of wholeness be in that home. This is note two here. You cannot give God's gift of wholeness without first receiving it yourself. Now, how can the apostles give God's gift of wholeness unless they had it previously? Whole people, complete people, are used by God to make other people whole. Jesus came to bring us Irene, God's gift of wholeness. And that's the only way that we can share this with others. Empty people have nothing to give. Um, so not, maybe not so much now, but in Bible times, you draw water from a well, right? With a bucket. If there's no water in that well, can you draw water from the well? No, you can't draw water from the well, right? So what these verses are saying is that the apostles were not just to give God's gift of wholeness to a host family, but in the Greek here it says to let it come forth. To let something come forth would indicate that this gift of wholeness and completeness from God was already with them. Jesus, who is God, was saying to the apostles, give God's gift of wholeness to your host. So is there anything really that's better than that? This is note three. Christians today would be called to offer God's gift of restoration to others. So now at this time, it's important that we understand that Jesus had not yet died, risen, sent the Holy Spirit. So we as Christians today experience the Holy Spirit indwelling in our hearts, and this is how we receive God's gift of completeness. However, it is very true that the disciples knew Jesus, had encounters with Jesus, and were given power and authority to do miraculous works, including declaring the kingdom of God, Jesus is God's greatest, most, and precious, complete gift to man. Still, the truth is, the disciples, now apostles, were taught to give God's gift of wholeness to every house that they stayed in. What an example to copy. We should seek God to be filled to overflowing with the Holy Spirit, his presence, his word, so that we may let it come forth to everyone around us. We are to be vessels, nothing more, seeking to be filled so that we may overflow to others. This is not a selfish thing. How could it be? It is never selfish to seek more of God, more of who he is, more of his word and his power and his presence in your life, in the pursuit of overflowing goodness, mercy, and love. And you don't overflow until you're full yourself. What is selfish is to not seek to be overflowing. This is note four, and what I mean by this is seeking God for an overflow of himself for the benefit of others is never selfish. Let's go back to verses 7 and 8. As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. So what was Jesus' purpose in sending out the apostles? To proclaim the kingdom of God, 
heal, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, drive out demons. Could the apostles have done any of these things had Jesus not given them the authority and the power to do these things? Can any human being without God do the things that Jesus was asking them to do? So we can do nothing apart from Jesus. That's John 15, 5. Now, um, it's probably because I live with a natural medicine doctor. So we're going to get into a little bit of natural medicine here because it relates. Kind of paints a little picture for us here. Natural medicine paints an interesting picture of what is lack, wholeness, and completeness. When you consider that man was made from the dust of the earth, We understand that he was made of natural elements, but yet he didn't become a living being until God breathed the breath of life into him. Still, he was made from the earth. Natural medicine looks at the restored, complete, and whole state of the body as lacking nothing, functioning perfectly in order according to the way that God had designed it. Natural medicine looks at the body when it's sick as having lack or lacking completeness and a state of wholeness. Natural medicine considers disease a dis-ease. Two words, not one, right? So like you can break it into two words like dis-ease, a lack of ease and full functioning of the body the way that it's supposed to. That's how it looks at it. The body is supposed to function in ease. Natural medicine says says dis-ease is what we call disease. If the apostles were to let God's gift of wholeness and rest on every house they stayed in, is it not true that healing the sick, raising the dead, casting out demons also restored people to God's gift of wholeness? Right? They had what we all know as disease, right? And I just said natural medicine looks at it as dis-ease, that that there's something in the body that is not at ease, okay? So would you agree that somebody who was dead, they're probably in a state of dis-ease. It's not so easy, right? Um, Or severely sick or leprosy or or, uh, spiritual possession, demonic possession, right? Out of, uh, out of ease, out of order, okay? So what I'm saying is we can consider those who were possessed, sick, and well, yes, dead, they probably lacked health, right? They lacked vitality. They lacked freedom, lacking a state of fullness and completeness. So this context of what we're happening in verses 12 through 13 and the miraculous happenings in verse 8 are strikingly similar, The apostles were given power and authority not just to make people well, but to make them whole and complete again. That means this gift was already with them. It's painting a picture of whole people used by God to make other people whole. God is working through them. Look at what proceeds in verse 8. What proceeds verse 8 in verse 7. What came prior to the miraculous? Verse 7, as you go, proclaim the message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Why is this? Why is it first the proclaiming of the kingdom of heaven, then the cleansing of the lepers and the raising of the dead and the healing of the sick and driving out demons? First, they had the kingdom of heaven proclaimed to them because there is no greater miracle. Okay? So we have all these things that people, there, there's just no greater miracle than that that can happen than salvation. There's no single act that is any greater than God saving a soul. God provided salvation to mankind that all who would believe have eternal life. This is your fifth note here. Salvation is the greatest miracle. That's the first thing that happened here. I think it's super important for us to remember, right, that yes, 
would it be, would it be, look, Jesus gave authority to the disciples that they could go out and do these things. Go out and drive out demons. Go out and heal the sick. Go out and raise the dead. Like people who had died, go out and command them to come back to life. I mean, big deal, right? Little deal or big deal? <laughs> big deal, right? Like big deal. Like Jesus is giving the apostles, like this is a big deal. Like the power and the authority that he gave them and despite that being a big deal, primarily, he says, first proclaim the kingdom of God. Okay? So many people might argue that the greatest miracles come in the form of healing or in raising the dead. But it's not true. None of these things happen without the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. Now, we as Christians today, right? I'm not saying that at this time that Jesus had been uh, crucified and that he had uh, died and that he had risen and that he had sent the Holy Spirit. So chronologically, no, but they had been with Jesus and he gave them this power. But for Christians today, so Jesus said that we could do all these things. We could do all of the same things that he had, that he had given to these apostles. He said, you can do all these things and more. We can go out and we can lay hands and pray for God to heal them, right? We've, I mean, we've, we've seen it happen. We can go out and command evil spirits to leave things in the name of Jesus. Jesus gave this power and this authority, right? Jesus, all power and authority belongs to Jesus on heaven and, and, and in earth. So, but none of these happen th things happen for believers without the resurrection power of Jesus Christ living within you. So, again, the words of the Apostles' Creed are very, very true across all generations, um, across all time, across all cultures, across all races, um, your background. And I just wanted to share this with you. Um, the Apostles' Creed, the, here, the word Catholic is just simply meaning all believers. But listen to these words from the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father, the Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell, and on the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. So all Christian people believe these very basic things. You can believe more than this, but you can't believe less. It's a uniting creed across all denominations and all time, all races, all cultures. So what happened that those apostles encountered were able to be healed um, the, the people that they encountered, they were able to be healed, raised from the dead, and liberated from evil demonic forces. What happened that enabled them? Jesus gave them the power and the authority to do these things, but first he said, the kingdom, go out and declare the kingdom of God. That was the first thing. That is the greatest miracle. That Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, that God has come in the flesh and that he lived on this earth among us. He walked what we walk through. He lived on this earth. He experienced life like we had go through experienced life. He was tempted in every single way, yet he did not sin. That is why he can empathize with us. That is why he knows what we go through. He has walked this earth, and he has lived this life. And it doesn't matter what you go through. You know, the things that in, in the scripture where it says that Jesus was tempted in every way, yet he did not sin. When he was tempted in every way, that means every way. Like Jesus, there's everything Jesus was tempted by. Yet because he was fully God, as well as fully man, yet he did not sin. So there's nothing that we go through in this life that Jesus has not walked through was tempted by that didn't that he that he won't understand that he doesn't know what it's like that's why we can trust him he walked this earth so 
What's the lesson that we can draw here about that the kingdom of God was declared to them? There is no single greater gift than salvation. Is there a greater gift than God saving you? No. And we just, we just agreed that these things, like to be able to go out and drive out demons, to be able to go out and, you know, uh, God giving us resur resurrection power when we believe in Jesus Christ, to go out and, and, and to be used by God to heal the sick and to raise the dead and, and cleanse lepers and all these things that are happening. So when we have resurrection power, we, we just agreed, like, these are big things, right? These are big deals, like someone being raised from the dead. But yet we have to consider them as pale in comparison to salvation. So there's no single greater gift than salvation. If you desire to see people made whole, made well, freed from power of sin and darkness and sickness, if you desire to be used by God to see miracles happen in the lives of other people, you must first look to God to be filled and full of everything that he is, because like we said in the beginning, you can't give what you don't have. You must get everything that you are from Jesus. If you want to give love, you need to be filled with his love and know what his love is. If you want to give forgiveness, you need to experience God's forgiveness. If you want to be used by God, if, if you say, God, please use me to use me as a healing agent for somebody else, use me that when I place hands on, my, on someone else, that your power goes to work and sick people are made well. Ask God to fill you with his healing power. If you want to help restore relationships, you need to primarily understand how your relationship with God has been restored. Um, God is our ultimate source for anything and everything that we could ever need. As with the apostles, whole people make people whole. That's why I'm calling this giving from a whole heart. Our wholeness, our completeness comes through salvation. And through this Irene peace that Jesus brings into our lives, we need to realize that Irene is something that we already possess. It has been given to us. So it's like this. So in the Christian Missionary Alliance, so we believe that, if, for example, there's the Trinity, God the Father, God the, or God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, right? Behold, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. So Trinitarian theology, they are one, right? So if we receive Jesus and we get Jesus, do we also get the Holy Spirit? Yes. If you receive the Holy Spirit, do you also get God? Yes, because they are all one, right? They are all one. So we don't, like, get them separately, okay? So we need to realize that our, this Irene, Jesus came to bring this peace. We already have been given this Irene by Jesus. We have wholeness and completeness within us. Once we come to a greater understanding of exactly what this is, we will realize, like I said earlier, we can give endlessly to others as God has already restored us to right relationship with himself. God has already done all the work that is necessary for you to have salvation. And salvation from Jesus includes this Irene peace. God has already given it to you. So when we rely on God and his resources and his ability rather than our resources and our abilities, that supply, it just keeps coming. And you can give freely. Freely you have received first, right? So freely you may give. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that we see in scripture that uh, you have come, um, that we might have this Irene peace, this wholeness, completeness, restoration. And we see in Scripture that we are called um, to offer that to other people. Lord, help us to look to you primarily. Freely we have received so that freely we may give. 
Help us to look primarily to receive from you that we may be filled up to overflowing with all of the good things that you are. Your mercy, your love, your kindness, your compassion, your comfort, your completeness. Help us to look to you first and rely on your ability to work in us and through us that we may freely offer these things to others. We ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. I invite you to stand as you're able, and let's join in singing our last song, What He's Done, celebrating the work of Jesus and the importance of his work in our life. This is a new song, but it's easy to catch on to. So we're going to invite everyone for the fall luncheon, which is downstairs uh, right after service, and we're going to pray for that meal now. I did want to point out, please see your bulletin for announcements and events, things that are happening here at Lakeview, as well as uh, you can check out our website online and find out more information there. So let's, let's pray for our service and pray for our meal together. Father, thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. We thank you for each and every person here. 
Lord, we ask that you would bless the food that we're about to eat, and um, thank you to everyone who helped put that together. And we're just asking that as we go forth into this world, uh, that you would fill us with yourself, and that um, we would become overflowing with your goodness, your mercy, your light, and your truth to a world who so desperately needs it. We lift all these things to you in the name of Jesus. Amen.